good evening, everyone. It is seven o'clock in Washington, D.C. It is six o'clock in Chicago, and it is five o'clock in Santa Fe. This is yet another Defending Rights and Dissent event where we have as many time zones as we do panelists. My name is Chip Gibbons, and I am the Policy Director for Defending Rights and Dissent. I also host the Still Spying podcast, which explores the history of FBI political surveillance in great detail. Tonight's program is brought to you by not just Defending Rights and Dissent and Still Spying, but Truth Out, uh, one of the best independent news outlets there is currently. I want it. So tonight we are discussing Fred Hampton, the fight for truth. Uh, 51 years ago, the Chicago police raided the office of the Illinois Black Panther Party, firing 90 shots. They killed Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. It was later revealed the FBI was involved in planning the raid. The killing of Fred Hampton has been called an execution, an assassination, an American dissident Noam Chomsky called it the gravest crime, domestic crime of the Nixon administration. Central to exposing the truth about Fred Hampton's death are two attorneys, Flint Taylor and Jeffrey Haas. They both worked with the People's Law Office and they represented the, both Fred Hampton and the survivors of the raid. Flint is the author of the book, The Torture Machine, which I highly recommend. It details not just his involvement in the Fred Hampton case, but his involvement in defending the survivors of a neo-Nazi attack in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is unfortunately very relevant again today, as well as his revelations about Chicago police torture, which are truly shocking. And we're also joined by Jeffrey Haas, who wrote the book, The Assassination of Fred Hampton, How the FBI and the Chicago Police Murdered a Black Panther. And I would also recommend that people check out the Defending Rights and Dissent Report, Still Spying on Dissent, The Enduring Problem of FBI First Amendment Abuse, which uh, covers uh, more recent instances of FBI surveillance. Flint, Jeff, thank you so much for joining me tonight. It's our pleasure with you. So I guess the question I want to start off with, and for people who are watching and don't know this, uh, Jeff came on the Still Spying podcast to do a whole episode about Fred Hampton. But for those who are watching and maybe haven't heard the Still Spying podcast and don't know a lot about Fred Hampton, who was Fred Hampton? Can we just start with that question? Well, um, I'll start. Uh, Fred was the very dynamic young leader uh, in Chicago who became the chairman of the Black Panther Party in Chicago when it opened in November of 1968. Uh, Fred had been the head of the NAACP youth group. He had led demonstrations in high school demanding that black girls be considered for homecoming queens or and having more black administrators and teachers. As his father once said to me, Fred just couldn't accept injustice anywhere. He was introduced, he introduced Stokely Carmichael when he came to Chicago and people were so impressed by his speaking ability that when the Panthers started, he became the head of the Panther Party. Mm -hmm. And the Panthers had a tremendous amount of energy uh, in Chicago as they did nationally. And Fred had the ability to speak to welfare mothers, to college youth, uh, to people from Puerto Rican community, the Appalachian community. He was a tremendously charismatic, dynamic figure. And I think also he didn't just talk, he lived it, he lived what he talked. If he said be at the breakfast program at 6 a.m., uh, he was there also fixing breakfast, serving breakfast, or play, playing with the kids. And so that was the way he was. And so he just uh, inspired all the people around him to do more, to be more committed. There's been a lot of discussion last week about Fred Hampton's Rainbow Coalition. Could you talk a little bit briefly about what that was, for people who maybe have heard vague things about it or, or never heard about it? Yes, um, the, as Jeff alluded to, uh, Fred and the Panthers worked very closely with uh, other organizations of, of brown people, uh, particularly the Puerto Rican Young Lords Organization, uh, white people, uh, progressive white folks, uh, the Young Patriots, uh, also worked with um, 
street gangs or street organizations, particularly uh, tried to organize uh, the uh, Blackstone Rangers as they were known at that time. Uh, and that Rainbow Coalition was part of the reason that Hoover and the FBI targeted the Panthers both nationally and locally because the Panthers, unlike a lot of uh, quote, black nationalist organizations uh, were open to working with anyone who shared their principles, shared their principles of revolution, shared their principles of self-defense, uh, shared their principles of being uh, opposed to imperialism and the war in Vietnam. So the Rainbow Coalition was uh, uh, something um, much earlier started in Chicago than when uh, Jesse Jackson uh, recoined the phrase in the 80s when he was uh, running his uh, progressive uh, campaigns for president. And, and, and how would you describe the politics of the Black Panthers at this time? I mean, there's sort of a, a, a milieu of sort of new left groups at this time that they're part of. How, how would you sort of just sort of briefly describe their politics and sort of the, the general politics of left groups at the time? Well, I definitely, Fred called himself and we were at the rally when he made everybody stand up and say, I am a revolutionary. And by the time he had said it three times, everybody else, including me and Flint, were saying it too. So he definitely saw himself as a revolutionary, bringing about revolutionary change. Uh, he talked about the international proletariat. He definitely was an internationalist and anti-imperialist, and he uh, felt close ties to other struggles. This was 1968 and 69, when liberation struggles were going on around the world, and Fred felt very much connected to those. He also talked about the working class a lot. And uh, he also talked about, we don't fight race, you know, racism with racism. You don't fight fire with fire, you fight fire with water. So he was for revolution. Um, he was spoke in terms of the proletariat. He also spoke in terms of uniting. Uh, he had that speech, black power to black people, brown power to brown people yellow power to yellow people, red power to red people, and X power to those I left out, because he had a sense of humor too. So it was very broad based. Uh, it, it was a, a, a revolutionary agenda, but I wouldn't say it was a dogmatic agenda. It was inclusive. And he also understood to organize people. He said some of these moms may not understand or agree with socialism, but they sure like our breakfast for children program. So within a revolutionary context, I think it was also very inclusive and very outreaching. Yes, and um, the the specifics of the of the politics that Jeff uh, touched on were laid out in the ten point program of the Black Panther Party that appeared on uh, the back of every one of the weekly newspapers that they put out for many years and sold many thousands of copies across. Uh, not only Chicago and Illinois, but across the entire country. So they were very um, self-conscious uh, about their politics. Uh, sometimes uh, their politics are homogenized to just be uh, the Breakfast for Children program, the free medical clinic. But uh, like Dr. King, when he spoke out in, in 67 and 68 against the war in Vietnam and spoke very radically about uh, what needed to be done. Uh, the Panthers also spoke very radically or re in a revolutionary way about not fighting in Vietnam, for example, opposing and resisting imperialism, and also self-defense and self-defense of the black community against police brutality, defending yourself if the police attacked or, 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 or attempted to illegally arrest you. And so that is a thread that certainly uh, runs to the present time in terms of opposing uh, police violence and police brutality and calling it out for what it is. I, I think their program, you know, in, in many ways uh, is mirrored in some of the demands today. They demanded community control of police was one of their main objectives uh, and ending the uh, prison, uh, ending mass incarceration. Uh, they included also the land, bread, housing, not making, not uh, drafting black people to fight in foreign wars. So it was a very revolutionary demand uh, that they were making. They were demanding a radical social change. 
and, and on the episode of the podcast where we talk about the Black Panthers, we read part of or part or all of the 10 point program. And it is amazing, like as Flint said, a lot of those demands still resonate today, including those about racism and police brutality, but also demands about housing justice and full employment. Uh, it is still very much a a document that that speaks to the woes of, of our society. So we've discussed who Hampton was, and I guess at this point, I'm gonna move into the darker part of a program. What happened on December the 4th, 1969? Well, um, there was a, um, a raid, a police raid at 4.30 in the morning. Uh, it was led by uh, a sergeant named Daniel Growth and 14 Chicago police officers working under uh, the command of the state's attorney, the elected state's attorney of Cook County, Edward Hanrahan. Uh, and they came armed with not only a submachine sub gun, uh, rifles, uh, shotguns, but also with a floor plan that was drawn by the FBI uh, and its uh, informant, William O'Neill, and his control agent, Roy Martin Mitchell. Uh, and they fired more than 90 shots into the apartment, uh, and Fred Hampton lay dead uh, in his bed, uh, murdered by the Chicago police, actually assassinated, as the title of Jeff's book uh, speaks to, um, by the Chicago police at the hand of not only the state's attorney of Cook County, but secretly of the FBI. And I'll turn it over to Jeff to pick up uh, from there. Yeah, I, I think it's why it's both political and very personal to Flint and I. We remember December 4th, 1969, we just started a law collective called the People's Law Office, and we were representing the Panthers. And I was woken up at 6.30 in the morning by my law partner, Skip Andrew, saying that he had just heard that Fred was murdered uh, and he was going to the uh, coroner's office to identify the body. And he said, why don't you go to the police station where there were three survivors of the raid who had not been shot, plus there were four at the hospital. So that morning on December 4th, I went to the, went to the county jail and there I saw Fred's fiance, uh, who was eight and a half months pregnant with their uh, son, Fred, who was born posthumously. And I asked her what happened. And she said, they came in shooting and they came into the room where me and Fred were and they pulled me out of the room. And one cop went in and said, is he dead yet? And another cop, and I heard two shots and the other cop said, he's good and dead now. And that's what I heard. Um, and, I, and I just want to say it's almost immediately following the raid, the cover up started where the police version was that they. My next question had, is about the cover up. Oh, yeah. So uh, and Flint, away. Flint can tell you a little bit about how he started. Whereas I interviewed the survivors, Flint actually went to the apartment and saw what happened. Right. Um, um, I also got a call that morning. Um, I don't remember who exactly it was from. Uh, it might have been Skip Andrew or one of the other people from the law office. And my assignment was to go to the crib, the Panthers crib, uh, where Fred Hampton and, and uh, uh, Mark Clark and, and the seven surviving Panthers were sleeping. Uh, and when I got there in the mid-morning, uh, it was uh, just a, a remarkably uh, life-changing experience for me, as it was for Jeff. Um, we uh, went into the apartment, uh, and um, the walls were stitched with, with machine gun uh, holes from machine gun bullets. There was blood on the mattress in the back bedroom where Fred was shot and murdered. Um, and the Panthers had started to do um, uh, tours of the apartment. Uh, they, they always had a very good sense political sense, uh, and they knew that uh, what the lies that the state's attorney's office and the police were putting out about it being a shootout needed to be rebutted. And in some ways, the apartment itself stood as the strongest uh, statement about the lies and about what really happened. So over the next 10 days, while I and many others from the law office were uh, carefully taking evidence, filming and taking pictures of, of the crime scene. Um, 
The Panthers were taking people through the apartment, literally thousands of people, not only from the west side and south side, but from from uh, around Chicago and around the suburbs as well to see what had really happened. And um, on the, one of those uh, tours, while I was taking evidence, uh, an older uh, African-American woman came and she was looking at the walls and she was shaking her head. And she said, um, ain't nothing but a Northern lynching. And um, that really has stuck with me uh, as that s crime scene has over the decades. I'm always really struck by the Panther strategy of opening up the crime scene to the public and to the media. You know, as the three of us, I think, all know, police lie all the time about their actions. Your book, The Torture Machine, is just a horrific uh, story of police lying about people's guilt, their own torture. And unfortunately, a lot of people are willing to believe the lies of the police. And one of the really interesting phenomena in, interesting is wrong, one of the things that happened in the last year is with sort of the ubiquity of cameras on cell phones and the internet, we've been able to sort of counter a lot of these police lies with, with recordings. I also about six years ago wrote a story for Truth Out, who's co-sponsoring about how these types of sort of cell phone and social media videos during the Israeli bombardment of Gaza had really helped to sort of cause Israel to lose control of the narrative and their own brutalization of the Palestinians. But but back then, you know, you didn't have cell phone cameras. And in a lot of cases, it would come down to the police's word versus, you know, the other person. And unfortunately, our system is set up for the police to be believed. But the Panthers really had an ingenious way of, of getting around it. And you know, I, I get invited to speak sometimes to college classes and also socialist night schools um, about the FBI. And I always show those the picture of the holes in the door from the gunshots and say, you know, and you know, the police said it was a shootout, but here's the outside door, and it's just a shocking picture, blown to pieces with bullet holes from the outside. And there's no way you look at that and think the police did anything other than. Um, other than go in with guns blazing? Well, we didn't have video camera of the event, but we did have the ballistics evidence and we were smart enough to go in there immediately filming the apartment as it was left, gathering the physical evidence, the shells, the cartridges and so forth, and then had people put dowels through the holes to show the direction. The police came in from one side of the apartment, both the front and the back door, and the Panthers were at the other. So you could see the trajectory of the bullets because a bullet leaves a, is a smaller hole coming in and a larger one with the wood splaying out outward. And when we counted it up, there were 90 shots coming in and the only shot going out was, from a, was in the ceiling of the hallway, which came from Mark Clark after he had been fatally shot because he wouldn't have just shot up into the hallway. So it, it wasn't the police. Hanrahan thought he would it would benefit his career. So literally within four hours of the raid, he's on TV showing weapons he gathered from the Panther apartment and telling the world that the police were surprised that the Panthers opened fire and that Fred Hampton personally fired at the police from his bed uh, as they came in the back door. And that's the lie that started all of this. And then I can tell you some about what we did to uh, uncover the lie. And in addition, of course, the black community was outraged even though they were divided about the Panthers, the fact that a young black leader would be murdered in his bed and Mark Clark also, another young black leader at 4.30 in the morning was not acceptable. Yes, um, as you said, Jeff, um, the, the raid was, was a 90 to one uh, disparity in terms of, of bullets being fired. But of course the police claimed that it was a, a shootout, uh, that there was 200 shots fired and the Panthers fired half of them. Uh, and as I mentioned, when uh, we first got to the apartment, we could tell instantly that that wasn't true, but that uh, nonetheless, that narrative had already been stuck on the front page of all four of the newspapers in Chicago and on all the television stations. So we were fighting uh, already from a very disadvantageous position. But uh, we were able to show uh, through uh, pictures, uh, not only of the front door, 
uh, but also of the back door and the doors that uh, were across from the um, uh, places where the Panthers were sleeping uh, and the walls uh, where uh, in the of the small rooms that they were sleeping in. And as Jeff said, we lined up all the bullet holes and they all came from directions from the police. And furthermore, the, they tried to say, and they put on the front page of the Chicago Tribune in an exclusive that uh, there were some bullet holes on the back door and they circled them. And these were the bullet bullets that Fred Hampton supposedly fired standing uh, up in his back bedroom. And then they took some pictures of the, a, um, of the a door that had been opened and all the machine gun bullets had gone through. And they falsely claimed that that was um, a door across from where the Panthers were in one of the bedrooms. So that would mean that uh, these were shots that the Panthers fired. Well, we were able to counteract that in, 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 the, uh, in another newspaper, the Daily News, uh, and show that these were lies and that the bullet ho holes in the back bedroom were in fact nail heads. And we were able to show reporters that those were nail heads. And we were able to also show that in fact, the door that they were claiming the Panthers shot uh, showed that the Panthers shot were, it was in fact a door through which uh, the machine gun bullets had gone. And so that was one major uh, step on a long fight, a 13-year fight, as it were, to, uh, to change the narrative uh, from a shootout to a shoot-in to a murder to an assassination. And, and Fred Hampton, it's believed he was drunk the night of the raid. Go ahead. <laughs> well, yes. Um, chemical part of the analysis and not to go with the ballistics part. So on that. Yeah, we were, um, yes, I, um, there was several toxicological uh, tests that were done on Fred Hampton's blood. Uh, and there was an independent toxicologist from Cook County Hospital who was as part of an independent autopsy that we had done on Fred Hampton's body. Uh, she found a large amount of secobarbital in his system. And this was extremely uh, strange because Fred never used drugs. There was no one friend, foe, informant, um, fr um, panther who uh, would said anything but that Fred didn't smoke. Uh, he didn't use drugs. So those drugs had to have been put in his system by someone. Uh, and though we never... Uh, we're able to get uh, anyone to admit that they did it. Uh, the circumstantial evidence pointed to an informant, uh, the informant, William O'Neill, whom we'll get to later on in this discussion for sure, uh, who was in the apartment the night before and who some Panthers said had served food and, and Kool-Aid uh, to people there, uh, including Fred. So there was the opportunity and the means uh, to, to, to drug him by the informant uh, and also the evidence that he was drugged as well as evidence that he wasn't using drugs himself. So that was in essence the circumstantial case, uh, not only that he was drugged, but that the FBI may well have uh, been involved in drugging him. And what did the police do to the survivors of the raid in the immediate aftermath of it? Well, what happened was all the survivors, Fred and Mark, of course, were killed. Uh, four people were shot. Uh, Doc Satchel, particularly, they did a, used a machine gun through a wall into the bedroom where three Panthers were shot. shot. And, and Doc Satchel had four bullet holes in his colon. And so he had to go through serious surgery. He never completely recovered his health after that uh, with his 45 caliber machine gun bullet in his gut. Uh, all the Panthers were charged with attempted murder. Uh, uh, Deborah Johnson got out in time to have her son, uh, did get out. They did make bail. And we were also involved in defending them against these attempted murder charges. But four months later, surprisingly one day, the prosecutor dropped the charges. 
And we learned the reason he was their evidence, the only evidence that they had that the Panthers, any of the survivors fired was two bullet uh, shotgun shells that the police lab said came from a Panther weapon. Uh, when it was further examined, it didn't come from a Panther weapon. It came from the police carrying the shotgun uh, inside. So they had no evidence of any of these people ever firing a weapon. So they dropped the charges. And so a lot, there was a sentiment, okay, they're free and so forth. But there were, the community and we didn't feel that we had, justice had been done just because uh, nobody was going to go to prison. So we, with the support of a lot of National Lawyers Guild, uh, Arthur Canoy in particular, uh, we'd never been in federal court. He said, you got to file a civil rights suit. And we said, you know, kind of what's that? And uh, he said, this is how you do it. This is what we did in the South. So he rallied us and we put together a civil rights suit against Hanrahan, the Raiders, the laboratory and the phony in investigation that was done locally. Um, and we filed that in 1970. So. I'll let Flint take a little bit of the chronology from there. Yes, uh, we filed it in 1970. Uh, we, we drew uh, perhaps the worst judge. Uh, and uh, for those of you who have followed Chicago judges and Chicago uh, cause celeb uh, cases, uh, this judge was perhaps worse even than Julius Hoffman, his contemporary who tried the Conspiracy 8 trial. And he was uh, extremely racist and, and extremely pro-government and pro-police. And so he threw a good portion of the case out, uh, particularly the prosecutors, uh, threw him out on immunity grounds. So we had one appeal just to get Hanrahan and the prosecutors back in the case. Uh, we won that appeal. And when we came back, uh, there was a fortuitous revelation that one of our clients uh, by the name of William O'Neill, uh, in fact, was not a panther, but rather, well, he was a panther, but he was also uh, a prize FBI informant mm -hmm. controlled by Roy Martin Mitchell, uh, who was a, 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 an important member of the Racial Matters Squad in Chicago, which at that time um, was... At, at that time, meaning the raid and previous to the raid, uh, was deeply involved in illegal and, and violent COINTELPRO activities against the Panthers, uh, Fred Hampton and the Chicago uh, Panthers, as well as nationally. Uh, and so that opened up a whole other aspect of the case. Now we had the prosecutors back in and we joined uh, O'Neill, uh, his control agent, Mitchell, and the head of the Chicago uh, office, um, um, Marlon Johnson, as co-conspirators. Uh, and then we embarked on, on uh, the rest of the case for the next 10 years. Uh, maybe Jeff wants to pick it up, pick the ball up from there uh, in terms of our fight to uncover the, the truth and the depth uh, and the breadth of the FBI's secret involvement uh, in the murders of Fred Hampton uh, and Mark Clark. So we knew by then, uh, by 72, we knew that O'Neill was an, uh, yeah, that O'Neill was an informant. And also because of the break in to the FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania, and people put together that there were some documents that said COINTELPRO. And when they followed up, they discovered that was a Hoover's program, uh, counterintelligence program directed at the left in particular, at the black movement in particular, black leaders. Uh, and by, but by the late 60s, he had declared the Panthers as the greatest threat to the internal security of the nation. And so the COINTEL program specifically directed FBI, every FBI office that had a Panther chapter to disrupt, destroy, and neutralize the Panthers by any means necessary. Uh, and of course, those words disrupt, destroy, and neutralize can be used to cover, not, not an explicit, but of course it can be used to encourage any kind of contact. Among their other objectives was prevent the rise of a messiah who could unify and electrify the black masses. And so they mentioned that Stokely Carmichael could be such a person, King could be if he gave up his uh, supposed uh, uh, acceptance of nonviolence, uh, Elijah Muhammad, uh, and so they named people in that. 
but they specifically directed them to prevent the rise of the Black Messiah. So we said, is there a connection between COINTELPRO and what happened to Fred Hampton? The judge said, there is none. You can't even go into it, but we did anyway. And through a connection with the church committee, and we began to get documents that, that showed there was a connection. We got a document that showed that before Fred was killed, the FBI in Chicago sent what we called the hit letter to Jeff Fort, the head of the Blackstone Rangers, pretending to be a Panther saying, dear brother Jeff, I've been hanging out with the Panthers. I just want to tell you they got a hit out on you. I know what I'd do if I was you, signed a black brother. So they were asking Jeff Fort to take revenge on the Panthers and probably on Fred Hampton. He didn't respond. But nevertheless, that gave an idea of, of, of what exactly the, they were trying to do in Chicago um, to the Panthers, what their objectives were. And then we got another document that a local, that a U.S. attorney gave us. This was Watergate. So I think we didn't want to get caught hiding or covering up a document. There was one FBI document in a file called Do Not File File, which meant only one copy of it was made. And he, after we urged discovery, they claimed he given us everything. This, none of this stuff came easy. It took 13 years, but four years just to get to trial. He produced the floor plan. And the floor plan was something prepared by O'Neill and Mitchell of the apartment, showing the layout, all the furniture, all the rooms, and the designation of the bed where Hampton and Johnson would be sleeping. So we said, now you have a COINTELPRO program, you have a informant, the FBI uh, got a floor plan, and Roy Mitchell admitted that he actually met with the Raiders, met with Jolivec and Growth, and gave them the floor plan. He told them there were weapons there. So that's sort of the evidence we had uh, that we gathered. Uh, Clint, why don't you take it from there? Well, yes, that we fought very hard for that evidence uh, pre-trial, and it was almost over the dead body of the judge and the, and the government. Uh, and then we got to trial and we had uh, the floor plan and we had testimony that linked O'Neill and his control agent to setting up the raid. Uh, and we also had some evidence that pointed to the fact that the um, FBI had specifically uh, covered up their role to the federal grand jury and to a, a state grand jury. Um, and so that was uh, the crux of what we went to trial with, along with a document that was dated the day before the raid, which uh, uh, embraced the raid uh, as uh, an upcoming COINTELPRO project of the FBI. But during the trial, uh, Roy Martin Mitchell, the control agent, made a, a, a slip up in his testimony that led to the revelation that they had uh, covered up some 200 volumes of documents that were relevant to our case. And the judge unwittingly told them uh, to bring up whatever they had. And the uh, U.S. attorney and the, the Justice Department lawyer was so, uh, I think, freaked out by the breadth of their cover up that they wheeled in 200 volumes of documents uh, that, the, that were relevant to what we've been trying to get over the many months and years. Uh, and it took several months for them to scrub those documents, giving us a couple of documents per day for a couple of months. And then when they got to the 200th volume, uh, they turned it over and it was O'Neill's uh, control file, uh, his personnel file. And in that file, uh, we found uh, what we called the bonus document. And it showed that Washington's FBI office and Chicago and Mitchell and his supervisor uh, had requested uh, a $300 bonus, uh, which we called uh, the 30 pieces of silver uh, for O'Neill uh, in recognition uh, for the tremendous value that his work, his floor plan, uh, his information had been to the raid and making it a success. So now we had basically a, a three prongs on a triangle of conspiracy 
uh, that, that was the bedrock of our federal case. Uh, the floor plan, uh, the COINTELPRO document saying uh, that the raid was part of the, that project, and the bonus which showed that Washington and the local FBI defendants had celebrated the raid and rewarded O'Neill for that. And I'll pass the baton back to Jeff. You can see that, it, as he said, this wasn't an easy struggle. It was a long struggle. It was many, uh, multifaceted, multi-layered. And uh, if we have time, we'll get to the present. Uh, yes, we will get to the present. Don't worry. We'll try to do that. The trial lasted 18 months. Uh, and it was a dogfight every day. It was me and Flint and another lawyer named Jim Montgomery. Uh, and we were up against uh, local counsel who were being paid private counsel handsomely, as well as U.S. attorneys uh, and uh, a very hostile judge. So every piece of evidence that we got uh, was a fight. And I think at some point, and, and it was also with a, a, a penalty, sometimes both Flint and I ended up in jail for a night on contempt, plus numerous other contempts. But by the end of the trial, we had put a lot of evidence in. Uh, the judge had made it difficult for the jury to follow it. Uh, so then the jury goes, the judge gives a, a jury a couple of instructions. One is, if the Panthers had a rhetoric, an anti-police rhetoric, then the raid was justified which meant they could have been killed in their beds because they had against police brutality. Um, and the second one was that if they had illegal weapons, then the raid and the killing of them was also justified. So the judge gave the jury a couple of instructions that he expected them to come back with not guilty. When they were deliberating after 18 months and had deliberated a few days, uh, the judge saw maybe this wasn't working. Uh, and so the defense, the lawyers for the, uh, police officers put in a motion to dismiss the case. And while the jury was deliberating, the judge dismissed the case, assessed costs against us for $100,000 and set an appeal bond. And so we were pretty broke and, and down, needless to say, after all of this. Our plaintiffs, Mrs. Hampton, Mrs. Clark, had given up work, had come to court, had sought justice, had sought the world to know what happened to their sons. And then this is what the judge does. And I think if we hadn't known Fred and his dare to struggle, dare to win, and been been still uh, inspired by him, it would have been it would have been tough. But we sort of picked up our our ourselves off the ground. We got a black court reporter to say he'd give us the thirty three thousand page transcript on credit, and uh, we started filing an appeal. So Flint, why don't you take it from there? Well, we filed an appeal and we, we drew, uh, there's a three judge panel in the uh, Court of Appeals, uh, Federal Court of Appeals. Um, and we wrote a 250 page brief uh, that uh, in, in, the, in the opening cover had pictures of uh, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark and the sign, we signed it all power to the people, which would give us you a little idea of that we weren't conventional lawyers then. Um, uh, for sure. Uh, but we drew two other three judges we drew uh, were favorable to us. Uh, one uh, was a, a former Lawyers Guild lawyer. Uh, and then the third judge was a former FBI agent. So you can imagine what the decision was. We won two to one. <laughs> and uh, we got a wonderful 70 page opinion. Uh, that's perhaps one of, one of the most landmark decisions in the, in the law books because it talked about all the evidence we put in. It talked and defined the conspiracies that we had alleged, both the conspiracy to, to, to raid and to destroy the Panthers uh, and also the conspiracy to cover it up and to harass the Panthers post-raid. Um, we were able to survive in the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, the, of course, uh, everyone on the other side took it to the Supreme Court. Uh, it came back to the trial court. We got a, a decent judge uh, in the early 1980s when it came back from the Supreme Court. And we were then uh, able to, uh, because we had been given, uh, the, the appellate court had said, not only do we get a new trial, but that we get all the evidence uh, that had been suppressed and we get to have a hearing on the misconduct of the government in covering up the FBI documents. So because of that, and because of the strength of the opinion, 
uh, we were able to negotiate uh, a, a, a uh, settlement on behalf of the uh, families and the survivors, which at that time was the largest uh, police violence settlement in the city, uh, in the uh, country. And that um, was 1982, 1983. It actually was formalized in early 1983. So we, Fred was murdered and Mark were murdered in 1969 in December. We filed the suit in early 1970. And a mere 13 years later, we resolved the case. And you had tried to, at one point, include J. Edgar Hoover and, and William Sullivan, who was the director of domestic intelligence, as defendants, correct? Yes, we, we, had, we uh, uh, attempted to join not only Hoover and Sullivan, but uh, George Moore, who was right under Sullivan. Uh, Sullivan was the head of domestic intelligence. He was, was the number one man under Hoover when it came to domestic intelligence and counterintelligence. Uh, and Moore was under him in the extremist section, whose uh, prime focus was the Black Liberation Movement and the Panthers. We had tried to join them and John Mitchell of Watergate infamy because of the federal cover-up. And the judge had, um, had stopped us from doing so. Uh, we were uh, one of the other things we were thinking of doing and, and was pushing it uh, when the case came back for a retrial was to join Hoover and Sullivan and more. But as I said, uh, before all of that could be accomplished, uh, we, we were able to use those levers to, to, to reach a settlement uh, from the government, uh, from the county of Cook because of the state's attorney's involvement, and from the city of Chicago because of the police involvement. And for people who don't know who William Sullivan was, he is the person they believe wrote the letter to Martin Luther King encouraging him to kill himself. There's this very infamous FBI act where the FBI sent uh, tape recordings of King's personal life to him and his wife with a letter claiming falsely to be a former black follower of King who had become disillusioned because of this you know, surveillance he had just so happened to be able to do and urging him to kill himself is considered one of the most abusive things the FBI has done. Uh, James Comey, the former FBI director who is even by official Washington standards rather pompous, um, you know, has, has said he read the letter and it made him sick. You know, he made a big production about this. And that letter, it's believed by most people to have been written by William Sullivan. And I believe Sullivan was central in 56 to setting up the Cointelpro program to begin with. Uh, the origins of Cointelpro in 56 is the FBI is upset at Supreme Court rulings, making it harder to get convictions against communists. So they decide if we can't prosecute these people because they've broken no laws, we will use what the church committee called uh, covert action using the techniques of wartime to maintain the existing social and political order. Um, so Sullivan is a very, very bad man. I mean, people know that Hoover was a villain, but, but Sullivan also uh, deserves proper credit for his uh, ignominious villainy and just despicable conduct. Well, you know, Chip, um, when just before our trial, uh, we were on to Sullivan and Moore and Hoover, and we were trying attempting to bring them in at that time. And we were able to, and myself and Hollis Hill, uh, one of the young lawyers in our office, went to Washington and we deposed not only um, uh, Sullivan, uh, but Brennan, who was uh, was the head of the uh, the part of uh, of the uh, FBI that did all the black bag jobs, and uh, some other high officials in in Washington, and I, I went and dug up that transcript when we uh, got the the documents that are the, the new documents that um, Aaron Leonard got. Uh, from the FBI and sh showing uh, Sullivan and uh, Moore and Hoover's involvement in the Hampton uh, cover-up. Uh, and, and I n noticed that I'd asked a lot of the right questions, but the government had instructed uh, Sullivan not to answer any of them. Uh, so I kind of wish we had that, um, that uh, deposition on video like we do them now, uh, but... Um, that was in 1975. And you mentioned Aaron Leonard, who I know is the person who, who got the new documents that we're going to talk about 
uh, I just want to give a, a shout out for Aaron Leonard. Uh, he is he is also a friend of defending rights and dissent and truth out. And he came on a program like this to talk about his books on uh, the Bureau of Surveillance of Folk Singers. So he's done a lot to uncover um, FBI surveillance. Let's talk about the new documents that Aaron Leonard has found. What's in them? And what difference would they have made if you'd had them in the 70s? Um, well, let me, yes, about last month in December of 19, in 1970, uh, I got an email from Aaron Leonard that all of a sudden uh, a five-year-old request he had made for the personnel file of Roy Mitchell, the agent, uh, he got two, two folders, 200 pages each, of the folders of Roy Mitchell, things that we had never seen before. And we had asked every question and we had sought everything in discovery. So 51 years later, it was actually on December 4th, he gets these files uh, and he sends them to us. And so of course we compare them to what we have. Uh, so I'll just, a few of the highlights and Flint can go into more details, but one, one of the most amazing things that we never got any of these documents before. Uh, uh, in spite of all this discovery, in spite of depositions and everything. Second, I guess the most outstanding document in a way was a bonus not only to O'Neill, as Flynn has described, but there was a bonus to Mitchell, to mm -hmm. Roy Mitchell, that came from Hoover personally, a, a $200 bonus congratulating him and saying that the work he had done uh, was critical to the work of the FBI. And that document actually started, it, it came on December 10th, but it actually started from Sullivan. And it showed that as early as December 1st or 2nd before the raid, Sullivan and Moore and Hoover were following Mitchell's use of his informant. And so the, the, the bonus actually was started before the raid when they knew that O'Neill had provided the, the information about guns and probably the floor plan. So it shows one hand that people at the top, at the very top, were very focused on what was happening in Chicago, particularly between Mitchell and O'Neill. Uh, one of the other documents in there is one that says uh, the FBI person had been in, in, uh, submitted to a state grand jury. And it said, it was a direction that said, if this person gets asked any questions about blank, they're immediately to leave the grand jury and report to so-and-so. This was a year after the raid. The FBI role in it was not known at that time by anybody. It might never have been known if COINTELPRO hadn't been exposed or if O'Neill hadn't been involved in a murder that became public and exposed his role as an informant. But they said, do not, if this person is asked any questions, he's to leave the grand jury. And then there's the rest of it is redacted if he's asked anything about blah, 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 blah. So even 50 years later, the FBI is redacting documents. Uh, and uh, several other documents are redacted as well. What also is in there is in the continuation of the following the raid in December 4th, throughout 1970, they are continuously rewarding Mitchell for the job he did, congratulating, saying how it was so important to the mission of the FBI. And this was when it had all been exposed that there was a shootout and everything. Still internally, the FBI was congratulating themselves, congratulating and continuously rewarding Mitchell. And I think the idea was also, let's keep Mitchell's keeping O'Neill honest and telling him what a great job he did. So what we see is, this cover-up still goes on. The redactions are today. Um, and we still, as Flint said, and he can go into this even a little more detail, had we had these documents that showed Moore and Sullivan and Hoover intimately involved, not only after the raid, but before the raid and what was going on, we could have built a much stronger case to getting to them, possibly to Mitchell and Nixon. Definitely. Um, as lawyers, uh, these documents uh, would have been extremely useful in, in building that bridge uh, evidence-wise evidence uh, to Hoover and um, uh, Sullivan and more, which we understood both politically and from the COINTELPRO documents uh, 
that they had to have been involved. And that's why we went to depose them. But the judge had limited my examination so completely that I couldn't get to make that link. And certainly we didn't have the documents to make that link. Uh, so as lawyers, we're looking at it now, Jeff and I, and saying, wow, if we had these documents, we could have shown the importance that what was happening in Chicago and the importance of O'Neill in not only the, the work in Chicago, but it was something that uh, was so important uh, that Hoover and Moore and Sullivan themselves were in, on it and interested in it and rewarding uh, them, both O'Neill and Mitchell, uh, for their work here at just at the time when O'Neill and Mitchell were uh, setting up the raid and covering it up afterwards. Uh, so it's a remarkable fourth prong. I guess it's no longer a triangle. It's, it's a box uh, that, uh, of, of documents uh, that I mentioned before that that, that, that are the bedrock of the conspiracy. Now, on the one hand, Bobby Rush on December 4th stood in front of the Panther House and said, we lay this on the, uh, at the feet of J. Who Edgar, which is what he referred to Hoover as. And to some people, when they read the Art Truth Out article, they say, well, you know, we knew that. But and yes, we knew that. We Yes, we tried to make it part of our case, but no, we didn't have the documentation. And both as lawyers and as historians, and I think as, as, as people who uh, want not only to, to have uh, well-constructed beliefs, but also to have the, the, the documents that, that prove your thesis or, or, or prove your theories, this is the, the another peg in that in that um, construction. Uh, and so that makes these documents very important. They've still deleted documents. Um, I haven't told Jeff this yet, but I just got a call an hour ago from Bobby Rush, who along with Fred Hampton started the Black Panther Party. And he's now in Washington and has been for many years uh, as, a, as a powerful member of the Black Caucus of the House of Representatives. He saw the editorial in the Chicago Sun-Times today about uh, these documents. And he said that he's going to make an effort to make sure that uh, the Justice Department under uh, Biden opens up the files, opens up the wow. files. So we'll see if that goes anywhere. But uh, that was quite a, an important phone call, I thought. Uh, and with this movie coming out in the next few weeks, it's going to highlight uh, Fred and his relationship with O'Neill. I think there's going to be quite a bit of, of, of interest, uh, renewed interest in, in the assassination of Fred Hampton uh, and the murder of Mark Clark. Uh, and we'll have to see the, the political fallout and the political ramifications um, of what Aaron Leonard has started here by opening up the files. It's interesting you mentioned the, oh, we always knew it angle, because whenever we see government misconduct exposed, there's always this chorus of people being like, oh, oh, you knew they were doing this already, even though we didn't have, have any facts. And um, not to get too far afield, but uh, the journalist Jeffrey St. Clair and the late Alexander Coburn wrote a whole book on sort of the CIA's involvement in, in drugs. And they did a whole chapter call on what they called the CIA art of the uncover up, where they would talk about how the CIA in collaboration with the media would, would keep facts from the public realm. And then when they would come out, they'd say, oh, it's no big deal, you already knew this, right? Even though, even though we didn't already know the facts and the details. And, you know, I, I've seen that again and again with with the Snowden uh, revelations, people I, I know who um, were involved with the NSA would say, oh, but you already said we were spying on you, right? And it's like, okay, but you, you said we weren't, you didn't have the documents. Or with any of the Chelsea Many WikiLeaks stuff, it's always like, well, you already knew, you know, the US was covering up war crimes. So it's very interesting to me how this sort of quote unquote uncover up uh, playbooks to still exist to this day where you, you know, say, well, you already knew this, what, what's the big revelation? And of course, these are historic revelations. And I am excited to hear that Representative Rush 
is working to open up the DOJ files under Biden. Defending rights and dissent will, of course, support those efforts and, and do what we can to galvanize our, our supporters to, to do so as well. Um, Jeff, do you have any, any thoughts? Yeah, there is a difference between knowing something and having evidence and actually seeing the other side collude around something. We knew the Vietnam War was a fraud and we knew that the people who started it knew it from the get-go, but still when we got the Pentagon Papers that showed from the outset they knew it was a losing proposition uh, and that they were lying to us from the beginning had a huge effect. Uh, and on the other things you've said, specifically around surveillance in the Iraq War, I was up at Standing Rock and we knew there was all kinds of drones and intelligence, but still when we learned that Tiger Swan, a counterintelligence group that started in Iraq, had been hired by the pipeline to do spying and counterintelligence uh, on the Native uh, American stand there, that's always, uh, you know, it, it, it's still different than thinking they're probably doing it or knowing oh, it. So it, 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 it is remarkable. And I think in Hampton, I think it may be, it's, it, in a way, it's the most well-documented case of a government assassination in our history. Uh, not the uniqueness, but the, but the fact that there's so much evidence, uh, so much duplicity, just this recent document that's that is the reward document directly from Hoover to uh, Mitchell saying him your your outstanding services in a matter of considerable interest to the FBI and through your aggressiveness and skill in handling a valuable source he is able to furnish information of great importance to the bureau this was written on December 10th six days after the raid so to see them not only setting up the raid but continuously congratulating themselves, I think, is a level that is still somewhat shocking, even if you could probably figure out it probably happened. And I know Flint mentioned the, the film. I, I know it officially hasn't come out yet, but I'm, I'm curious if either of you have been given a sneak peek of it and if you have thoughts on it. We um, have. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, we haven't been given a sneak peek. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I know it has a fantastic cast. Uh, so it's certainly going to highlight the role of O'Neill and, uh, and, and highlight Fred Hampton. I've read about how the actors, one has been learning opera so he could play, be Fred Hampton and the other one is learning about what a devious character O'Neill was. So I think that's going to be fascinating, but we have not, uh, Actually, we've not participated directly in the making of the film, and we have not been given a sneak preview. Yes, that's true. <laughs> so what I'm hearing you saying is you're going to come back for a, a film review night and join us when the film comes out and, and share us your thoughts. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Uh, um, we're hearing it from you. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, so do you have any final thoughts as we close out this program tonight? Well, I think uh, Jeff summed it up quite well and the, the importance of, of uh, seeking the whole truth, seeking who in fact was involved, seeking the documentation and the evidence of it, whether it's you know five or 10 years in litigation or whether it's 50 or 75 years uh, is important, not only for history, not only for the uh, establishing and maintaining and fighting for the true narrative about cases of government assassination and, and government torture and police torture, uh, but, but also uh, for the movements, because uh, we as elders, uh, um, people who have been through a few things and, and, and know a few things, uh, need to impart uh, to the newer generations, the generations who are taking up the battle in the streets and in the courts and around the country, all the wonderful young people, uh, particularly those of color, who are fighting some of the same battles uh, and coming up against the even more streamlined versions of, of government repression and, 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 and cover up. Uh, so they, they know that they're not painting on a, bla a blank slate but that there is uh, historical precedence for this uh, that make uh, what they think is happening in the present moment uh, uh, something that is even more believable and understandable, analyzable and combatable uh, than it might be without 
uh, the uh, uncovering of the of the evidence. I would just say that formally, shortly after it was became public, the form COINTELPRO program ended, which didn't mean that surveillance or cover up uh, ended by any means. So government. Uh, illegal surveillance, illegal harassment, and repression of movements has continued, and, and we've seen it in different forms. We saw it at Ferguson with the tremendous armament of the police. We saw that again at Standing Rock uh, with the use of drones, with the use of water cannons and all kinds of equipment. Uh, and of course, recently we've seen the infiltration of law enforcement by the right wing and the direct collusion of the two. Uh, so all these things go on uh, in different forms, but I think the objective is still there. Uh, I fear, as, probably, as I've seen other people have, that new laws that may come down might increase surveillance, and it could be against the left, and it will increase restrictions on demonstrations, which also could increase the penalties. We saw after Standing Rock uh, interfering with any kind of infrastructure of a pipeline from going a misdemeanor became a uh, felony for which you could get 10 years. So COINTELPRO uh, by its own name has ceased, but repression and government efforts to destroy the movement have not. And those are all issues we've been working on at Defending Rights and Dissent. The uh, pipeline bills have been uh, proffered as quote unquote critical infrastructure bills. And we've been involved at the grassroots level in opposing them. We also do uh, a number of documentation of contemporary FBI surveillance including of Standing Rock, including of Ferguson. And we always try to make the connections between the past and the present to show how it's happened in a continuum and how these aren't isolated incidences, but part of a larger uh, pernicious political surveillance that is the norm. On the podcast uh, episode, you came on, Jeff, it was part two of a three-part series within a series exploring the FBI's war on black descent First, starting with Gerald Horn, a professor talking about uh, McCarthyism and how that was used against civil rights activists. Then you joined us to talk about the Panthers by Hampton and Cointelpro. And finally, ending with an episode with a current activist talking about what's going on with black identity extremism to make it clear that this is part of one uh, long arc of history. Flint, Jeff, it's always such an honor and a privilege to speak to both of you the work you've done over the decades in exposing the FBI involvement in Hampton and standing up for victims of torture in Chicago. It's just really phenomenal and, and heroic work and we all are better off for it. Um, I really want to thank both of you for joining us tonight. Um, we mentioned Aaron Leonard a lot, so I want to uh, give a shout out to him again. Uh, we did an event like this with him on his book, The Folk Singers and the Bureau. You can find it on the Defending Rights and Dissent YouTube channel. And I want to thank Truth Out, Defending Rights and Dissent, and Still Spying for sponsoring this event. The article that Jeff and Flint have recently published is called uh, New Documents in Fred Hampton Case. Suggest, New Documents Suggest Jedgar Hoover was involved in Fred Hampton's murder. You can find it at truthout.org. You can also find the Still Spying podcast at stillspying.org. And you can find all of the work of Rights and Descent at rightsanddescent.org. Uh, thank you, everyone who tuned in. And thank you again, Flint and Jeff, for joining us. This has been a really powerful evening. Thank you. Thank you.